Hello there and welcome to another live chapter reading for Itsy Bitsy Puppets. Today I shall be reading from Gravedigger Academy 4 by C. A. King. Chapter 1. The world was but a shadow, not dark yet not completely pitch black either, but rather dim enough for eyes to need to strain in order to see things clearly. A full moon lustrously lit the tree-bordered road, nary a leaf on any branch. It wasn't the season's fault. All hadn't been officially declared. Something unnatural was at work. Something sinister. A rotten stem showed bare back on the chilling breeze. One she'd never smelt before, nor would she want to ever again. No doubt her next movements would bring about even more now desired phenomena, undesired phenomena. Michaela glanced from one side to the other, her gaze coming to a swift stop on the sign a few feet ahead. Athethia. Population 666. One more step and she'd be inside the dreary town's limits. One more step and she'd officially become part of the gloom. She inhaled deeply, putting on a brave face before jumping straight in with both feet. Just as expected, a sad desperation swallowed her whole. The place was to blame, not her own mood. Athena was overrun by lost hope and squashed dreams. Anyone who entered was destined to feel the effects of emotions that strong. It was unavoidable. Why? Who knew? Limbs quivered, shaking off the chill, attempting to gain access to her soul. That was the last thing she needed. There were enough problems on her own plate without shouldering an entire town's worth off the top of it all. Michaela, the voice was low, soft and almost endearing. It screamed, find me, without actually saying the words. Michaela. Who's there? she asked, spinning around, desperately searching for the owner of the disembodied call. There was no one. She was alone, at least in flesh and bone. The cemetery to the left, however, might have disagreed about in spirit. Perhaps someone or something was hiding within, or attempting to break out. Not so much as blinking an eye at such a thought made her feel peculiar. No one needed to become that accustomed to the dead wandering about, messing in the living's lives. That's what gravedigger magic was for, to stop them from rising, and put them back if they did. Cheeks pressed up against cold iron bars, eyes desperately searching for a sign. Anything or anyone was fine. She needed something to go on other than that ghostly voice calling her name. Wow, she gasped. Art. This cemetery's grave markers weren't the normal run of a mill sort. She's seen enough of those over the past few years to know. A real tombstone connoisseur. Besides the fact that no, not one was out of place, none of them were cracked or broken either. What should... We what she was looking at were carefully sculptured monuments meant to honour the dead, not just back where they were buried. On one side, a statue of a mother was hunched over a stone, marking where her child lay to rest. The sight caught her gaze with fascination. Liquid dripped from the figure's lifeless eyes. Tears? Could sculptures cry? Gargoyles could. She'd seen it happen. But they were creatures cursed to eternally spend their daylight hours turned to rock. This one wasn't alive, at least she hoped that that was the case. One could only imagine how horrible living a lifetime or more turned to stone would be. There were those unlucky few, she knew, who experienced something similar for a bare few days. Their scars ran deep, mentally and physically. Her mind wandered to Frankie's family. Then there was Thomas's mum and dad as well. She shook her head, turning her attention back to the cemetery. A few rows towards the back, the life-sized witch idols stood over two other graves, one poised to cast one spell or another, but frozen in a moment. A necromancer, perhaps. It could have been erected as a warning or a punishment. There was little use speculating now. Eyes narrowed to slits, watching writing appear before her face on the surface of a blank gravestone. Jezebella Peacock, 1947 to... The second date remained blank, almost as if a blinking coaster on a computer screen was waiting for someone to type it in. Who was she? Michaela, the voice came from further up the street, a house bordering the far edge of the cemetery. She hurried, following her senses and instincts. They had gotten her this far. Hopefully they won't let her down now. Everything led to this one wooden door, paint chipping around the frayed, frayed edges resembling the state of her own mind. <laughs> and nerves. Knuckles whitened, preparing to knock before noticing a small white button. The fist fell to her side, 
a shaky finger extending in its place. It was lit up as bright as a flashlight. Was it going to work after being pressed? There was no time like the present. The button went in and came out. A pink tongue popped out, wetting her lips. Patience was the name of the game and she was losing. This was worse than waiting for an elevator in a busy hotel. The lip button mocked her. It demanded she try pressing it again and again. Of course she obliged, trying to ignore the silence quickly closing in around her. What? a grumpy man asked, answering the door. His white eyebrows were long enough to curl into tiny ringlets. That wasn't the only odd hair he had either. There was a barren spot in the middle of his head while his sideburns, moustache ends and a tuft of whiskers at the bottom of his chin were all braided. It can't be, he squinted, face moving for a closer look, before he reluctantly admitted needing the glasses swinging from a chain hanging around his neck. He lifted the lenses. Jez, is that you? How are you here? How is this possible? I'm sorry, she answered. My name's Michaela. The glasses fell back to his chest. Of course you are, he huffed, looking both ways outside the door. The corners of his mouth twitched, trying to curl up, as if it had been some time since those muscles had been used to form a full smile. Come in quickly. Thank you, she said, sidestepping in. One hand covered his mouth. You were careful, right? I mean, you weren't followed, were you? No, she replied. Good, good, he nodded. So what can I do for you, young lady? Most of the folks round here don't go out of their houses this late. He shook his head. You are the spitting image. One hand waved in front of his face. Never mind, Michaela, was it? I'm Pilma, Pilma Peacock. You can call me, he glanced over from head to toe. Sir. Okay, sir, she said, surveying her surroundings. Everything was a few decades out of date which wasn't all that surprising given the age of the, age of the owner of the house. I heard a voice coming from this direction. I was hoping to find whoever was calling me. A voice, his eyebrows waggled like crawling caterpillars. There's no one here but me. Everyone in town knows that. Well, I'm not from here, she answered. Her weight shifted nervously, not knowing how to behave under the unusually strange circumstances. I see, he mumbled. That explains why I've never seen you before. He moved to lean against the mantle of an unlit fireplace. Where did you come from then? How did you get here? Tell me everything. I walked, she answered. Walked? He moved to a curtain, carefully peeking out the small crack at the side. Just strolled right through the magic barrier without a care in the world, eh? Oh dear, he sighed rather loudly. I suppose they know who you are here then. They who? she asked. The watchers, he answered, foot tapping. This is bad. One hand tucked on the braided whiskers at the bottom of his chin. Where exactly am I? she questioned. Athenia, this is a place where those who are meant to be forgotten live, he replied, unborn tears swimming in his eyes. That's why there's a magic barrier. I don't understand, she admitted. A person can't very well be forgotten if people come and go now, can they? he snapped. We can't leave and you most certainly shouldn't have come. The person must be strong enough magic user to portal through the barrier without being noticed, or able to use them gravedigger shovels. I never did understand the things. He shook his head. Those are the only way, two ways to outfox the hunters, he shrugged. At least for a little while. Nothing's ever permanent now, is it? He glanced off in the distance, not looking at anything in particular. Not even death. I can use them, she replied. The shovels. Brilliant, he said. You might just be in luck then. He gently guided her through the house. You can leave. Out the back you go. You'll be a hop, skip and a jump away from hallowed ground. Go to wherever it is you came from and forget you were ever here. No good can come from speaking with the cursed. I haven't found out why I was called here yet, she exclaimed, pushing back against the two firm hands, desperately urging her toward an open door. There must be a message from here or something. Please, I need to find it. Fine, he huffed. If I was up to offer you a piece of advice, it would be to mindful of who you trust. Not all who appear friends have your best interests at heart, and not all who appear hostile actually are. Pick and choose carefully. Ding dong, ding dong. What are you waiting for? He asked through gritted teeth. They are here. If they find you, it won't be only our lives affected. Think of your family, child. Go. He shoved through the door, pushing her out into the pure darkness. I hope you enjoyed this chapter reading and that you'll go check out the book. Thanks very much for watching. Bye-bye.